Brian Cox. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you. Um, I'm on the wrong island. That's okay, Brian. Moment. Brian, I have to say that I so enjoyed seeing you in Connecticut, and thank you for taking my daughter backstage uh, to meet you and uh, hear a little about physics. Uh, how many weeks were you on that tour? Uh, I was in the U.S. and Canada for uh, two and a half months, actually, and um, arrived back from the last show in Texas last week. And uh, it was a it was a wonderful experience. I mean, to to go into some of the the places that I, I wouldn't have thought there was an audience to, you know, speak about these big sort of ideas, the the origin of the universe, the nature of space and time. Um, but I, I was reassured that the the all over the country there were people who uh, uh, shared my enthusiasm for understanding nature at its deepest. So I know Richard Garriott saw you in uh, New York City. I saw you in New Haven by Yale University. And it was interesting too, the observation, because so often people feel that um, there's this dumbing down of the world, yet I saw people really hanging on every word you had to say, Brian, which I know sometimes is a scary thought to think, but also that they wanted to participate and, and show that they wanted to be among a group of enlightened people. Well, I, I genuinely think, and I think, um, I should say, by the way, I was a, that was a very powerful talk that I'm that I'm following, and there you see that I think people are um, able to not only able to digest complex ideas, and when we're talking about our planet and its future, climate change, for example, it's an extremely complex set of ideas. But I think people are interested, and we often, very often, underestimate the. Um, the, the, the capacity of audiences to grapple with difficult problems, difficult political challenges and complex scientific challenges in that case. And so I, I tend to go the other way. And uh, as you said, in my shows, I I write equations down. I draw so-called Penrose diagrams of the exterior and interior of black holes, which are difficult concepts. But I find that virtually everybody that's there is what would enjoys being challenged intellectually. And I think that's something that perhaps we've lost sight of. Brian, you know, often the uh, comment I, I get um, about you from people when they hear you talk is how you're able to distill very complex um, science into something that they understand. So uh, earlier in, in the session, I was saying what I thought was next in exploration is that whole idea of communication. So what is it that you have consciously done or why do you think that the way you're communicating science or maybe it's a hint to other scientists how we should distill information to a wider audience. Well, um, I explain things in the way that I understood them. Um, and, and I find it, I think it's very important, especially when you're talking to young, younger audiences, to say that um, th this it isn't easy understanding a deep level in the sense that it takes practice. And I often make the analogy with learning a musical instrument, actually, there are very few people who can just pick up a guitar or a piano and play it, right? We, we all understand that we have to practice. And I think it's the same in science. And um, so the way that I understand, the way that I explain complex ideas is, is the way that I explain them to myself. And many of the, the those in the audience who may be experienced with teaching or indeed our teachers will know this, that what you find when you begin to try and explain concepts and teach at any level is that you immediately find that you don't understand things in the depth that you thought you'd understood them. And so it's it's a it, I think for me, it's just the honesty of not of, of trying to show that process that I went through. I didn't understand it when I started and I, I thought about it and I worked on it. And finally, I, I developed my own mental picture, and that's the picture that I try to convey. So, Brian, we're um, here at this session in the beautiful Azores, which we do miss having you here, and we're talking about what's next. Now, you talk about the biggest of what's next. So what is next in when we talk about the universe? I mean, even the most simple of, of, of questions, like uh, infinity, What's beyond there? Is there something before the Big Bang? Is there a multiverse? These are really big issues that you wrestle with. I mean, the very exciting, the immediate exciting results that we're going to see over the next few weeks are going to be from the JWST, the, new, the telescope that's the successor to Hubble. Um, I met, actually, on my tour of the US, a couple of scientists who are involved in that project. 
And they said, look, we can't show you these images, but they are astonishing. And I think they're coming out next week. So that machine, that telescope, is now fully operational. I'm, I'm led to believe it's beautiful. Um, but what that's going to be able to do is several things. One of the things is it can look so far out into the universe, but it looks so far back in time because it takes so long for the light to travel from those distant places to the telescope, that it's going to be able to observe the formation of the first stars and galaxies. So for the first time, we're going to have data on how those first stars and those first galaxies formed. And the other thing, from a, the perspective of life, so life beyond Earth in the universe, it's going to be able to analyze the atmospheres of so-called exoplanets, which are planets around distant stars. And it's going to be able to ca characterize them chemically. So we, you know, the, 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 the golden scenario, and I have no idea how likely this is, I suspect probably very unlikely, but the golden scenario, for example, would be to detect oxygen in an atmosphere in high concentrations, because then you have really a smoking gun for photosynthesis. And I think it is a remarkable possibility that we may detect life beyond Earth, uh, not in our solar system, um, on Mars or on Jupiter's moon Europa, and of course that's entirely possible, but we may detect it first on a planet around a distant star with that telescope. So that's the, the first thing I think is extremely exciting. Uh, the other thing I talk about in the live shows, immense progress being made into, it seems at the other end of the spectrum and completely esoteric, but it's in the understanding of black holes. So um, way back now in the 1970s, Stephen Hawking began this journey um, with his discovery of what's called Hawking radiation. So it's the discovery that black holes, in Stephen's words, ain't so black, right? They, they glow They're like coals in the sky and they evaporate. And over long time scales, they go, they will be gone. So they, they don't live forever, even black holes. And the question arose, well, then what happens to the stuff, the, the information technically, but let's just say the stuff that falls in? A very simple question. What, what If you fall, throw a book into a black hole, does it is, is all that information in the book gone forever from the universe? And in the last few years, the, the consensus now is that no, the information comes out again in the so-called Hawking radiation. But there's a beautiful uh, kind of coda to that, because Einstein way back. So you, you know, I'm speaking to explorers, right? So the compass, the compass, a fundamental tool of the explorer. There's a great story that Einstein, his dad gave him a compass when he was young, seven years old. And he saw this needle pointing north. And he said, there's something invisible here at work. There's something, there's something about nature that's making this happen. There's something deeply hidden. This is telling me about something deeply hidden, the deep structure of nature. In the 21st century, using this theory, black holes, this study of how the information comes out, has led us to suspect that space and time themselves are not fundamental. They're made of smaller things. So we're beginning to talk in terms of atoms of space and time, something deeply hidden in the structure of the universe. And so it's a very exciting time in this most esoteric of fields, the study of black holes. Yeah, it's very exciting. And Brian, you know, talking about the larger picture and what's next, you always have so many projects. And whenever we speak on the phone or um, in person, you always are telling me sort of that wish list of what's next. So what, what is next? What are you working on now? That's interesting. Well, my, my, the, the small part of my academic research I'm still able to do is on black holes. So I, I share a PhD student working on this so-called black hole information paradox. And um, I should say, by the way, that what's remarkable is that there's a close crossover between understanding these most strange objects in the sky and quantum computing, unbelievably. So I know we don't have time to go into that, but isn't it a remarkable example of serendipity in science? We all say, all the scientists in the audience will know this, people say, what's the use of what you do? And um, you know, Brian, we say, well- what's the use of what you do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, so of course, the, the correct answer is acquiring knowledge for its own sake about nature is is a powerful valuable thing to do in in and of itself however 
What's also we all know is that the spin-offs, the serendipity of discovery, the spin-offs from exploration or science, you can't predict them. That's why you do it. Of course, exploration is going into the unknown. Science is going into the unknown. Um, but in the case of black holes, we're beginning to learn things about how to build quantum computers and how to code the algorithms inside quantum computers, which are the tools that we'll use in the 21st century and onwards to investigate things such as climate and so on, very difficult natural problems that we want to face. So it's a, it, so the answer is the answer is that knowledge for its own sake is always valuable, uh, but the spin-offs are also very often valuable. So Brian, I'm going to end really on the biggest of questions, and this is something I'm going to share. I hope I'm not speaking out of school. I know you went to a <laughs> restaurant and you had a reservation under Brian Cox, and there was another Brian Cox who showed up, the actor Brian Cox from Succession. My big question is, who got the better seat? <laughs> well, Richard, the thing is that we'd planned it in advance. So we knew that we, we booked a table and he went in. Uh, well, I went in first, actually. I said, table for Brian Cox. And they took me to the table. And then he went in and said, table for Brian Cox. And the panic on their faces was something <laughs> to behold because they did not know whose table they'd given away. And it had been planned in advance. You know, this, this is the one aspect of Brian Cox that many people don't realize. Uh, you know, he's very dynamic on stage and, you know, he's talking about complex things. But when you sit with Brian Cox off stage, just he has just a fantastic sense of humor and irony and, and you know, loves to kid with friends. So there's the very humanistic Brian, which I appreciate and I have for years. So, Brian, thank you so much for I being here. I taught you to be funny, Richard. You know that years ago. <laughs> well, you, now if we really want to get into this, Brian, Brian and I roomed together in London about 22 years ago, and I was there when he met his wife, and I met him before he was Brian Cox. And so um, I remember we hadn't spoken for a few years, and I had a neighbor who was uh, British, and I, I don't know how your name came up, and she goes, I love that guy. He's so sexy. And I'm going, are you talking about Brian Cox, the one I know? <laughs> and so Brian has, has blossomed greatly in the, in the UK. And, and, and truly, Brian, and now I'm not kidding, I think the message that Brian Cox gives to the world and, and how he makes science fun and accessible and exciting, we need more Brian Coxes in the world. So Brian, it's so good to see you again and uh, hopefully next time in person. Thank you. Thank you very much.